In the previous lecture on the respiratory system, we focused upon what's known as the respiratory division of the respiratory system. The respiratory division is really where gas exchange occurs between the alveoli and the alveolar capillaries. The focus here is going to be on the conducting division, and that's really everything else within the respiratory system, or at least the airways that allow air to flow from the atmosphere into our body through our windpipe into our lungs. Here we see a right and a left lung. As you can see, the right lung has three lobes. The left lung only has two lobes. So the left lung, one, two, three lobes, and the right lung just has a superior and an inferior lobe. So the left lung has a superior, middle, and inferior lobe, whereas the left lung has the superior and inferior lobe. This region right here between the right and left lung is the mediastinum. That is where the heart resides. And these parts of the lungs are sitting directly on the diaphragm. Once again, we've outlined the different functions of the respiratory system. The goal with this video is just to focus on the intake of air, specifically the oxygen-laden air, to get it into the lungs to allow for gas exchange at the alveoli. So once again, the conducting division is merely for the airflow from outside the body to inside the body, delivering it all the way to the alveoli whereas the respiratory division is the interface between the alveoli and the alveolar capillaries. What we see here is a sagittal section of the head. Up here would be the brain, which we don't see in this picture, but this is the bottom part of the skull. This would be the bottom aspect of the frontal bone. This would be the sphenoid bone right here, nasal cavity, oral cavity. These are the lips, some teeth. This is part of the mandible right here. This is part of the maxilla. This forms the hard palate or roof of the oral cavity. This is a soft palate right here. Tongue. And we can see actually some tonsils here that we talked about when we were discussing the immune system. This is a lingual tonsil. This is the palatine tonsil. And this is a pharyngeal tonsil. So we're going to talk in detail about the nasal cavity in a moment here. Air certainly can be taken in via the nasal cavity or the oral cavity. From roughly right here to right here, which is known as the pharynx, what's known as the nasopharynx, the oropharynx, and the lar laryngopharynx. So the nasopharynx proceeds from the posterior aspect of the nasal cavity right down to where we see the soft palate here. The oropharynx is just this opening right here between the soft palate and this structure right here, which is the epiglottis. And the laryngopharynx proceeds from the plane of the epiglottis here down to the opening of the esophagus. So one thing I wanna point out here is that there are two avenues that air or food will travel down in the body or within the neck. So if we consume or drink something, if we eat or drink something, it's going to pass the oral cavity and then ideally move down into here. And this is the beginning of the esophagus, which is leading to the stomach. Air is supposed to go down here. And this starts with the larynx right here and moving on into the trachea. So this structure right here is the superiormost aspect of the larynx. The larynx proceeds from the epiglottis down to the cricoid cartilage. Inferior to the cricoid cartilage, we have the trachea. And I will show an image of the trachea in a moment here. This right here is the opening to the trachea that's known as the glottis. Bound on each side of the glottis are the vocal cords. So the respiratory system plays a huge part in speech. Because this is a glottis, this is referred to as the epiglottis. Now, this is really going to fold down and block the opening of the glottis during swallowing. 
it is virtually impossible for adults to swallow and breathe at the same time. And the reason we can't breathe is because the epiglottis is covering the glottis or the opening where air comes in and out. And it's not so much just, it's not so much the epiglottis folding down to cover up this space. It's a combination of the trachea and larynx moving superiorly and the epiglottis also moving inferiorly. So if we normally have the trachea and larynx looking like this and the epiglottis in this orientation, during swallowing, the larynx and trachea move superiorly while at the same time the epiglottis is moving inferior, inferiorly looking something like this. The role of the epiglottis is to block the opening of the trachea or the glottis, which is the opening to the trachea. So the esophagus is posterior to the trachea. Keep in mind over here to the left is anterior, over to the right is posterior. Looking back at the nasal cavity right here, this would be the floor of the ethmoid bone. And if this was a more complete drawing, you might see the Christogalli up here. But keep in mind, the base of the ethmoid bone is the cribriform plate, which is peppered with perforations or tiny holes. And through those tiny holes proceed olfactory receptor cells that drop down into the roof of the nasal cavity in a region known as the olfactory epithelium. And those olfactory receptor cells are going to detect odorant molecules, send the signal up into the brain, and that's how we perceive smell. But back to the respiratory system, we have the nasal cavity, the nasopharynx, the oropharynx, the laryngopharynx, the trachea right here, and then, excuse me, the larynx right here, and then the trachea. So let's take a closer look at the larynx. Here's a good image of the larynx and the trachea. So in light blue, these rings right here are composed of hyaline cartilage, as is the cartilage of the trachea. The trachea is composed of nine individual cartilaginous rings. We're just going to focus on the cricoid cartilage and the thyroid cartilage and the epiglottis. So we looked at the epiglottis in the previous image. We are looking at a anterior view of the larynx and of the superior aspect of the trachea. Here we have the hyoid bone. The middle of the thyroid cartilage is the laryngeal prominence, otherwise known as the Adam's apple. And the ligament that attaches the thyroid cartilage to the hyoid bone is known as the thyrohyoid ligament. In this image, we are looking at the trachea right here. The trachea is going to bifurcate into the right and left main bronchi. The bronchi are then going to divide into lobar bronchi, going to the different lobes of the lungs. And then those Lobar bronchi will bifurcate yet again into segmental bronchi. So we have primary bronchi. So we have primary bronchus, in this case, the left bronchus. Bronchus is singular, dividing into lobar bronchi and segmental bronchi. These are all covered with cartilaginous rings composed of hyaline cartilage. Coming off of the segmental bronchi, we're going to have primary bronchioles, and we do not see hyaline cartilage any longer within these tubes for airflow. The primary bronchioles are going to give rise to secondary bronchioles, and then finally to tertiary bronchi bronchioles, otherwise known as the respiratory bronchioles. Coming off these respiratory bronchioles are going to be the alveoli. So the respiratory bronchi bronchioles are leading directly into the alveoli. One thing I want to mention that the lining of the trachea is covered with 
ciliated pseudostratified epithelial tissue with goblet cells. And we're going to talk about that towards the end of this video, but I want you to keep in mind that the lining of this trachea is lined with ciliated pseudostratified columnar epithelial tissue. I want to just go back to this image really quick since we've looked at a few things in the rest, lower part of the respiratory tract. This is the trachea right here. This is the opening to the trachea. And then we have the epiglottis, excuse me, we have the larynx up here. The esophagus starts at about the level of the cricoid cartilage so that the pseudostratified epithelial tissue I just mentioned is lining the trachea. And anything that is propelled out of the trachea may be propelled superiorly into the esophagus. And we're going to talk about that. That's related to a concept known as the mucociliary escalator. Okay, let's talk about the nasal cavity. What we see here, we see three turbinate bones, otherwise known as conchi. Superior conchi, middle conchi, and inferior conchi. Between the conchi, these spaces right here are known as a meatus, which is a narrow, small opening that allows air to pass. So when air comes up through the nares into the nasal cavity, it gets swirled around these turbinate bones. And this is significant because this is going to allow for the warming, moistening, and filtering of incoming air. So we want warm air arriving at the alveoli. We want moist air arriving at the alveoli. We don't want the alveoli to be cold. We don't want the alveoli to be drying out. The filtering or cleansing is super important because the respiratory system, as we've talked about previously, is a prime means for pathogens to enter our body or any sort of debris or foreign material. One of the first places that foreign debris or pathogens are encountered, once again, is in the nasal cavity, and there's mechanisms to help deter or prevent these foreign particles, bacteria, pathogens from proceeding further into the respiratory tract. Certainly, there's going to be guard hair cells within the opening of the nares. But if we look at this image, if we look at this image right here, we can see the inferior, middle, and superior turbinate bones covered with a respiratory epithelium, which is identical to the respiratory epithelium that I was describing that lines the trachea. And this is covered with cilia, as you see right here. There's goblet cells right here producing mucus, which you may be able to see in a light green. So the goblet cells are secreting mucus that we see within the cilia right here. And the goal is that mucus is going to trap any debris or pathogens entering the nasal cavity. Then the cilia will sweep that posteriorly into the nasopharynx, into the oropharynx, laryngopharynx, and into the esophagus where there are enzymes designed to break that down. So that's how the air is filtered within the nasal cavity. The air is warmed because there are blood vessels in the underlying connective tissue. Keep in mind, all connective tissue sits on a layer, of, all epithelial tissue sits on a layer of connective tissue with blood vessels in it. And those blood vessels carry heat. They're going to dissipate heat and it's going to warm up the incoming air that is flowing around these turbinate bones on route to the nasopharynx, oropharynx, laryngopharynx, and down into the trachea. So that's how it warms the air. And then the mucus is also going to help moisten the air or humidify the air. So once again, these turbinate bones with the associated epithelial tissue covering it, the underlying blood vessels, the mucus from the goblet cells are going to warm, filter, and moisten the incoming air. If we go back to this image lining the trachea, and we only see the superior aspect of the trachea right here, but this is also going to be lined with the respiratory epithelial tissue, which once again is ciliated, 
pseudostratified columnar epithelial tissue with goblet cells. The goal is debris is trapped within the mucus that is secreted by the goblet cells, and the cilia will s- sweep that mucus with any debris or pathogens in it superiorly up and out of the trachea and larynx and have it drop into the esophagus where there are enzymes within the stomach that are designed to break that down. This respiratory epithelium within the trachea is known as the mucociliary escalator. That's it for the conducting component of the respiratory system or the conducting division. We'll talk more about the serous membranes of the lungs in the next video.